head of the country's central bank floated the idea of dumping the greenback as the world's reserve currency, replacing it with an international currency. Thousands of people gathered to hear Barack Obama deliver key foreign policy speech on his current European tour. His vision for America's place in a new world order. Returning vets could be a risk to our nation. We've got to give them a stake in creating the kind of uh, uh, world order that I think all of us would like to see. And one of the ways it will drive the change is through global governance. I think a new world order is emerging. This is a hoax and a scam which is designed to transfer wealth and power from the private sector to the government sector and from the government of the United States to a world government. And those people who have been yelling, oh, the UN's going to take over global conspiracy government. They conspiracy theorists. They've been crazy, but now they they're right. And who got the money? Hundreds and hundreds of banks, any bank or that has uh, access to the U.S. Uh, Federal Reserve's discount. You tell us who they are. No. You know, financial terrorism. They have the ability to tweak the knob. I am proposing that the Federal Reserve be granted new authority. The ultimate goal of the carbon tax and the cap and trade is to destroy production. This energy tax is the largest tax increase in American history. We're actually creating a global warming police. So number one, they can come in, the federal government can come in, inspect your house, and send you the bill. We're setting up a global warming Gestapo. One of the things that if you talk to our generals, they are desperate for is a civilian uh, counterpart to our military forces. I am fierce. And this is what I wear. Senator Barack Obama's presidential campaign is asking Missouri law enforcement to target anyone who lies or runs a misleading television ad. I've now been in 57 states. I think one left to go. The president, when he was in Europe last week, he met with the king of Saudi Arabia. He appeared to bow. President Obama today proposed something new, something called prolonged detention. Pre-crime is where people are arrested and incarcerated to prevent crimes that they have not yet committed. It's the World Wrestling Federation. It's the Washington Wrestling Federation. They put on this show that they're bitter rivalries, you know, villains, and they really don't like each other. But behind closed doors, they buddy up for a drink and make deals. Both the Republican and Democratic parties are owned by the same global elites. And on issues that matter to those global elites, they act as one. They've wrapped themselves in the American flag, and they've talked about preserving American heritage and principles, and all the while, they're working to merge us into a new world order where our sovereignty will be destroyed. We'll lose all connection with our American heritage. With Bush, you knew exactly what you were getting. It was, uh, there was no uh, uh, iron fist in, in a velvet glove, it was just the iron fist. Whereas with Obama, you've got the velvet glove and the iron fist. You know, a very sharp guy, very smooth, knows exactly what he's doing. Uh, for that reason, far more dangerous than Bush. <laughs> well, at the end of last year, I was willing to give Obama the benefit of the doubt. I thought it was premature to write this guy off. But now that he's been in office for a while, it's obvious that he is very tight with the Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan's on Wall Street, and he is extremely compliant and pliant to the wishes of the large banks, going back to the, what we saw with Robert Rubin under the Clinton administration, uh, changing laws in favor of the banks, and he's not doing anything to stop the banks. He's helping the banks continue to do what they were doing under Bush. So in fact, he's just a continuation of Bush on the subject of markets and finance, which is the most important part of his policy right now. People who voted for Obama wanted real change and are getting platitudes, they're getting a lot of nice talk, but nothing in the, in the way of concrete change is taking place. In this town, business as usual. There's one puppet master that controls the left, and there's a, a, the same puppet master controls the right. They control the Republican Party, and they control 
the Democratic Party. This is not a party issue. This is not a left-right issue. The question is, who should government serve? And it should serve the people. In fact, government is just a tool of the dominant minority that uses economics and government law to enforce upon a, the public various mandates. The right-left uh, paradigm in the U.S. and in, in U.S. politics is taken directly from the commercial world and the, the corporate world. In the business world, you have Coke, Pepsi, you have McDonald's, Burger King, you've got AT&T, Verizon. You know, you've got duopolies, and a duopoly gives the illusion of there being some competition and some choice. And it looks a little bit better than a monopoly. So, for example, in communist Russia, if they had communist Russia red and communist Russia chartreuse, there would have been the illusion of choice and something akin to democracy in Russia. But they simply said, forget it, we're just going to go with red. In the U.S., they have this left-right paradigm, which, uh, unfortunately, it doesn't take them out of the, the, the hard, cold fact that there is no choice. There's no social justice. There's only one choice, which is to supply more rent to the rent seekers who have now taken the whole system hostage. We've seen the limitations on government whittled away. We have seen this erosion to the point where today it seems like nobody does care. And right now in Washington, D.C., we have seen a fall of the republic. If the United States doesn't have its Bill of Rights and Constitution, it doesn't exist anymore. It's just more real estate, more dirt. And that's what these global corporatists want. They want to completely dismantle the Bill of Rights and Constitution, and they're doing that right now. This is the fall of the Republic. Our nation is dying. We the people that live in this fine country need to stand up, get involved, and take the system back. It's the Bill of Rights and Constitution that we owe allegiance to, not to a political party, and not to politicians that wrap themselves in the red, white, and blue, while at the same time, they destroy everything that that sacred flag stands for. So in the old days, you used to have this globe that with 180 some odd countries, and a few of those countries had a lot of power, like the Soviet Union, the United Kingdom, and the United States at various times. But today, you might better look at that globe and say that it's surrounded by huge clouds swirling around the planet. They know no national boundaries, they don't follow any specific sets of laws, and these are the big corporations. They basically control politicians around the world because they have all the money, and politicians always need money to get elected or to run their governments if they're, if they're not democratically elected politicians. They control the mainstream press, either through outright ownership or advertising budgets. They have massive amounts of lobbyists in Washington that have tremendous influence on our president and, and, and Congress. And they really are calling the shots. They form partnerships with the Chinese and the Taiwanese and the Tibetans, or with the Israelis and Arab nations, with Brazilians and Indians, with whatever country and whatever group of people has resources that they covet. And they, so for the first time in history, we really have this new form of, a, of an empire. Barack Obama is a puppet of the New World Order to bring in a World Bank, to destroy the economy of this country and to bring in global governance. And no matter how likable the fellow is, we as citizens of this country need to stand up and say no. We have to stand up to preserve a republic here and a rule of law, which is under dire threat. We don't want to live under a world government of the corporations, by the corporations, and for the corporations. I don't want to believe it, and that's probably what holds me back on it, but I'm certainly seeing enough indication that it could be true, absolutely, because they're always talking about Mexico and the United States and Canada ending up like Europe. And there's things done politically that seem to take us in that direction. And so I think it's incumbent upon all of us as American citizens to pay attention. This move to world government is not about roses and happiness and peace and in a better life. It's about enslavement. They said in their own writings from the earliest times to the present, the world they're bringing in is to be a world 
where everyone who is born or would be allowed to be born would be born to serve the state. That would be their sole function. That's if they had a job for you to fulfill or a need for you. July 4th, 2009. Across the United States, citizens gather to celebrate the Republic's founding 233 years before. Most people in the crowds were aware that America was going in the wrong direction, that things were changing for the worse. But few could grasp the sheer magnitude of corruption and looting running rampant like a disease through the heart of the nation. The engine of America's greatness is not just its liberties, but the people's willingness to fight to keep them. Hundreds of other nations have had much larger populations and greater resources, but have never produced one-tenth of the wealth, science, and art that the United States has. Why? In America, you had an amazing situation because you had, you had the founding fathers who figured out that they could deconstruct the monarchy in such a way and then reproduce it with the three primary branches of government in a way that would create checks and balances and, and separation of powers. So you could have room, therefore, for individuals to work within the context of a cooperative, which is a democratic system of government, but it would still have enough room for individuals to rise up and become profitable and self-sustaining and um, rich uh, in, in the pursuit of happiness without becoming dictatorial. Uh, but unfortunately, over the years, since all of those separation of powers have been cut away, and all of the, the, the beautiful design by the Founding Fathers has been co-opted by one corporate entity, one corporate communist entity, you don't have that anymore. So what we have, we're, we're back to where we were before the revolution. You have one monolithic state. For the first hundred years or so of the United States, after the 1700s, when we freed ourselves from uh, British rule, no corporation was, permit, was given a charter in the United States unless it served the public good. It had to prove that. And then its charter only lasted for 10 years or sometimes as long as the project to build a bridge or a canal or something lasted. But it, it had to be up for review and it could only get charters if it, was, uh, if it was shown that it was serving the public interest. That changed primarily because John D. Rockefeller uh, kind of bribed Delaware and New Jersey to begin with into accepting a different system where he said, listen, if I pay you lots of money in terms of taxes, et cetera, uh, I want to be licensed and not have to serve the public good. I want to be able to get around that law. And state after state after state changed at that point. In the United States, our Constitution and Bill of Rights recognizes that individuals have innate freedoms that can never be taken away by any government. For the first time in history, the people were unbound to reach for their full potential, producing and outcompeting every other nation on Earth. The rights of free speech, self-defense, private property, due process of law, and many others ignited a revolution in human development that threatened the despotic rule of monarchs and tyrants worldwide. But the corrupt elites had studied history. They knew that great civilizations could only fall from within. They know from previous experience and history that civilizations come and go and dwindle. They know the reasons why they come and go. Isn't the only hope for the planet that the industrialized civilizations collapse? Isn't it our responsibility to bring that about? Morty Strong, founder of the UN Environment Program, from his opening speech, Rio Earth Summit, 1992. Maury Strong is the man who said that uh, they would never allow another country to rise up as powerful as America. It will never be allowed to happen again. And he said, the best thing we can do is to tear down all the factories all the, the top commerce of the United States and level it and give it back to nature. That, so that was the advice from this character, who has tremendous power at the United Nations and was picked up and groomed by Rockefeller himself. Over the past decades, since the Kennedy assassination approximately, you've had an ongoing oligarchical transformation of virtually every country 
in the world. And in the United States, it's taken the form of an oligarchical counter-revolution against the reforms of the 1930s, with the Wall Street interest asserting itself as more and more dominant. And once bankers and oligarchs have power, the things that they do, you could call them a policy. You could call it something like a tropism. It's like the way a plant responds. Naturally, since they're oligarchs, they're going to try to downgrade the standard of living of the vast majority of the population. They're going to claim that the world is overpopulated, that industrialization, industrial pollution, and overpopulation are the main problems that face the world. And they're generally going to try to crush and mortify any kind of popular democracy or mass movements with any kind of progressive content. Nations rise and fall. Um, they knew how debt could never be recuperated. They knew that disease or, or prolonged war could wipe out the population and the future populations that pay off debt. So these guys all work together. That's why it's no surprise that today you have Lord Rothschild coming out, pushing the latest scam or religion that we must all believe in, which is global warming, which his personal bank, his family's bank in Switzerland, will be in charge of. They've run the system, the whole economic system of the world for the last two and a half hundred years. So why shouldn't they also run the economic system for the next few hundred years? The question of a ruling class, oligarchy as a ruling class, is posed by Plato in The Republic, where we find that oligarchy is a constitution full of many evils where the rich dominate the government by buying it and the average individual or the poor count for absolutely nothing. Oligarchy is a frame of mind. In other words, if you're a banker, this is already a worldview. It's a world outlook, and it implies the policies that have got us here, right? Malthusian policies, zero growth policies, driving down the standard of living, attempts to wipe out all kinds of mass institutions that might be a countervailing force. This is a scientific dictatorship, which Bertrand Russell said, and the Huxleys said, both Aldo and Julian Huxley said, they would bring in the scientifically controlled society. It's not just family planning, which really means abortion and so on. It's global planning, which is, which is literally sterilization and abortion worldwide for the ideal reduced society. And not just across the board, through genetics, uh, through the genome projects, through uh, the constant IQ testing. Globalization has economically destroyed the world. You've got at least 40 to 50,000 people who die every day worldwide from starvation, malnutrition, and diseases which can be cured for pennies, such as diarrhea. And if you ask one of these Malthusian oligarchs, don't you think that something should be done to raise the standard of living in Africa or South Asia? They'll say, no, we can't do that. That would wound the planet. That would oppress Mother Earth. So that's oligarchy. Uh, class consciousness in this sense is absolutely essential. If you think that bankers are the same as you, you're wrong. F. Scott Fitzgerald once told Hemingway, you know, the rich are different from us. And Hemingway said, yeah, they have more money. And F. Scott Fitzgerald replied, no, it's something much deeper. It's a whole different world. To be an oligarch, to be a Rockefeller or something of this sort, uh, means that you're in a completely different world with values which are the reverse of human values. Now, if you allow the oligarchs to continue to dominate, the destruction of world civilization is a matter of a few decades at the very, very most. So, choose. To force their agenda through, the elites are employing one of their favorite tools, artificial crisis creation, also known as the Hegelian dialectic of problem-reaction-solution. You never want a serious crisis to go to waste. And what I mean by that, it's an opportunity to do things that you think you could not do before. The Earth's ruling elite are first and foremost monopoly men. The founder of the Rockefeller clan summed it up simply when he said, competition is a sin. Uh, Rockefeller himself said that competition was a sin. And people quipped at that thinking it was one of his little jokes. He made many jokes about saving pennies and stuff like this. But in reality, he was telling you a truth that competition to a man like him, who worked for a much larger organization, competition truly was a sin. And 
the cartels that have been formed ever since uh, have become much bigger, more powerful cartels which can literally command governments, sometimes to go to war on their behalf, uh, have occurred. The economic crash of 2008 and 2009 was an engineered crisis designed to cripple sovereign nations globally to make way for a world currency and a new bank of the world. China's holding, what, 1.5 trillion worth. All over the world, they're holding U.S. currencies. They want to get out of them in a way where they're not going to lose on their investments. There's going to be a world currency. There's going to be a new reserve currency. They're going to push it through the IMF. That's going to be the banksters that are going to be in charge of it. It's going to happen, and it's going to happen sooner rather than later. There was also a question to Geithner. Do you think that the U.S. dollar ought to be replaced? And he, he blew it. He had a moment of, uh, of candor where he said, yeah, we're, we're considering that. So on that day, the dollar went down 1% within a couple of minutes. Uh, Chinese government proposal about a, about a global currency and about the IMF regulations, the new IMF uh, idea about you know, the general interest to borrow and having a faster uh, ability to disperse to the emerging market. As I understand this proposal, it's a proposal designed to increase the use of the IMF's special drawing rights. Uh, and uh, we're actually quite open to that suggestion. Timothy Geithner's comment about global currency is not off the table because it's not off the table and it's going to come. The whole world is ready to bail out of bucks. They just want to do it in a way where they're not going to lose on their investments. That's all that's going on. All the people around the world the Japanese who have a trillion, the Chinese who have a trillion, the Saudis have a trillion, the Europeans, something similar. They're all going to dump it at the same time. The rush for the exits. And that will then create hyperinflation. When America finishes supplying the manpower and the military for standardization of the world into the one system, and they want a secular world society with a hint of greening and gear worship for sustainability reasons. Uh, America, as they're finishing off this agenda, uh, they'll be pulling the rug from underneath Americans at home at the same time towards the latter stages. When the dollar starts to slide, and this was always the nightmare of Paul Adolf Volcker, who is now sitting in the Obama White House, once the dollar starts to go, there's nothing to stop it. There's no useful way that you can stop it once it begins to gather momentum. So I think we're facing the probability of some form of dollar panic combined with hyperinflation sometime during the Obama presidency. They're now pulling the rug away from under the feet of the people. They're becoming rapidly a non-manufacturing country. Any country that can't manufacture its own goods even for self-defense therefore is no, no longer sovereign, independent, and able to sustain itself, which tells you that this is all part of the plan. It started with the very um, beginning when you established that there was a, a Federal Reserve System given the power of the state to create money out of nothing and to do so without any regard to uh, the will of the people without any regard to what's behind the money system. In other words, strictly political and economic motives for the bankers and the politicians. Once you granted that power to a group, the Federal Reserve System, the economic crisis was inevitable. This has happened before. Every time in history when uh, the government was given the power or a group of banks in conjunction with the government was given the power to expand the money supply at will, those economic systems always wound up in crisis and always collapsed. So there's no reason to believe that the United States was given some kind of a get-out-of-jail-free card, an exemption from the processes of history. So the economic crisis began at the very beginning, and as a matter of fact, when the founders of the Federal Reserve System met on Jekyll Island back in 1910 and were drafting the, um, the Federal Reserve Act, one of the things they discussed was how to pass on the inevitable losses to the taxpayers. They knew 
that inevitably something like this would happen, and they knew that uh, there had to be some way to, to get out of it without destroying the banks, of course, because they were the banks. And they said, aha, we'll go into partnership with the government, we'll take our cartel agreement and pass it into law, call it the Federal Reserve Act, and we'll make the taxpayer come online and be responsible to bail us out if and when, when the failure finally comes. Who's going to soak up the derivatives? Who's going to soak up the debt? Who's going to be penalized? And right now, it looks like Wall Street's getting bailed out, and the little guy in the middle of Main Street America are all going to uh, pay, pay the uh, penalty. Can the economy be turning around here? Are happy days here again? And can we actually have growth without jobs? Is this an oxymoron, jobless recovery? We're going into the greatest depression. There will be no job growth. Unemployment will continue to escalate. Along with it, so too will crime, poverty, kidnappings, boar snappings. And the more things spin out of control, the harder the hammer is going to come down by the federal government to keep everyone in control. Power is much, much more important to them than money is. Money is only a way to the means. Power is the end result. The elite's main goal is to destroy national sovereignty and individual independence. To consolidate their grip on power, the banksters create artificial debt bubbles that are mathematically impossible to pay back. These are those sinister, toxic assets, the complex financial instruments that they talk about but never really name. They're paper based on paper. Their credit default swaps, collateralized debt obligations, mortgage-backed securities, asset-backed securities, structured investment vehicles, auction rate securities, and so on down the line. It's an immense mass of cancerous, fictitious, speculative paper, bloated in value, impossible to bail out. Triage the derivatives on their books. There's no way to bail out a $1.5 quadrillion black hole of derivatives, but nevertheless, they tried. The Wall Street cronies are crooks. Uh, if you leave the uh, vault to the uh, bank open, these people are going to help themselves. The, the job of the government is to make sure there's somebody there to make sure the vault is closed and very few people have the uh, combination. I'm William K. Black, Associate Professor of Economics and Law at the University of Missouri. Kansas City. I was a senior regulator in a number of different positions during the heart of the savings and loan crisis. On a staff level, I led uh, the re-regulation of the savings and loan industry. The purpose of regulation and effective criminal prosecution is to make sure that cheaters don't prosper, that honest manufacturers win in competition. The primary driver of the current crisis is accounting control fraud. These are frauds led by the CEOs of the major lending institutions and major banks and institutional uh, buyers of toxic waste product. How did it start? It started with mortgages, particularly non-prime mortgages. In September of 2004, the FBI warned that there was an epidemic of mortgage fraud, their words and that this epidemic of mortgage fraud would cause an economic crisis at least as large as the savings and loan debacle if it wasn't stopped. The FBI found that 80% of the mortgage fraud was being induced by the lenders, not by the borrowers. You know, much of the rage has been against the borrowers, but if you want rage, it should be at the CEOs who became fabulously wealthy by following a strategy based on fraud. The Wall Street people and their uh, friends here at the uh, Federal Reserve and at the U.S. Treasury and down down the Washington Mall here at the U.S. Capitol. That's where the damage was done and uh, if people want to vent their anger they need to vent it uh, against these people. Between the Bush Paulson administration and the Obama, Summers, Geithner, Volcker administration, there's really a total continuity of economic and financial policy. Geithner 
was on board at the Fed, the New York Fed, dealing with all these institutions. He didn't get it. And then we had this uh, fellow who came up afterwards, Mr. Friedman. He was on the Goldman Sachs board. And uh, he didn't last too long as a Fed chairman. Why? Because he had a conflict of interest. Is it possible that there's so much conflict of interest here that all you folks don't even realize that you're helping people that you're associated with and you should be recusing yourself for America's um, ethics? Uh, I, uh, you know, I behaved with the... Uh, you don't think you should have recused yourself when you asked Lehman to go in bankruptcy, you didn't put Bear Stearns in bankruptcy, and then you folded Mayor Lynch into, I mean, isn't there some point where you got to say, hey, I got a conflict of interest here? You don't feel any kind of scintilla of ethics on this thing at all? Uh, totally. I, I, I operated very consistently with the, in the ethic guidelines I had as Secretary of the Treasury, and when it became uh, when, when it became clear that that uh, we had some very significant issues with Goldman Sachs and with with, with why didn't you recuse with, yourself with Morgan then? Stanley? What I did then it would have been very wrong for me to recuse myself. What I did was I went and got a waiver from the ethics agreement because when we had concerns, who was in charge of the ethics agreement? What? Who's in charge of the ethics agreement that we, you got a waiver? We, we have we have a uh, office of of ethics at Treasury, and we have a White House ethics office. So you got it from the legal counsel from the White House? We we, we got it from the uh, the, the, the yeah. government ethics office. So we had Snow, we had Paulson, now we have Geithner. All these people cut from the same bowl of cloth. Uh, these are not independent Treasury secretaries. They're uh, part of the problem, not part of any solution. And it would have been nice to see uh, President Obama effect some change in Treasury, but he, of course, he went and got a, a Wall Street insider uh, as his Treasury secretary. Everything that's speculative, parasitical, cancerous, bloated from all these administrations, going back to Carter and even beyond, comes together in the Obama administration with Volcker, with Summers, who's part of the uh, economic crimes under Clinton, the guy who brought you derivatives and the abolition of the Glass-Steagall firewall. You could not have gotten a more perfect setup for a takeover from a previous government, the Bush regime, uh, than the Obama regime. Now, there are some authors out there already saying that it's the same bunch, and it's true. It's the same bankers who put the same boys forward. Obama, far from helping the public and giving them something new, or giving them more power and say over their own affairs, has actually sided immediately with the bankers, who once again, once again, have robbed the public blind, and now they must get bailed out by your tax money. Obama does it all with left cover. He makes you think that he's somehow different from Bush, that this is somehow benevolent, that he cares about the poor. And in reality, this is the cruelest hoax and the most bogus sham. Obama is 1,000% devoted to Wall Street interests. When Wall Street says jump, Obama jumps. And again, it's about 30 to $40 for the bankers, for every dollar that ever reaches an unemployed person or somebody who's on food stamps or some infrastructure building for highways. The hope with the Obama administration was that it would move us beyond this. But unfortunately, what we're seeing more and more is that Obama has brought in uh, many of the economists who bought into the system in the past. Uh, Larry Summers is a, is a very good example. And, uh, and, and so many of his economists, many of the people there, you can really almost at this point relate Obama to Hoover, who did something similar in his presidency, as opposed to uh, Franklin Roosevelt, for example, who brought in a very fresh team. So the concern here now is that Obama's falling into this trap of bringing in the same people who put us in the position that we're in today and other people who buy into the same theories that brought us here, this mutant form of capitalism. Presumably what most politicians want to come in is say, hey, the problems of the past, 
they're due to the old guy and I'm cleaning house and I'm going to bring in a new team and don't blame us for the things we've inherited. Can't say, you know, those policies of the past that came before were insane because you got the guy that was one of the key architects of those policies. People need to stop having allegiance to their political party. They need to have allegiance to the Bill of Rights, the Constitution, and what has made our republic so special. The basic human rights and dignity that every citizen of this country inherently has. Not because it's some right given to us by government, but because our Bill of Rights, our Constitution enshrines that these are inalienable rights given to us by God, that we inherently have as sentient, free, conscious beings. But instead the public cheers on the Republicans as they win or cheers on the Democrats as they defeat the Republicans. It's an endless, staged, gladiatorial event, special interest own both parties, and they project this false left-right paradigm up as like a movie screen. And behind that, behind the throne, the establishment is able to control our society and engineer it into this high-tech police state. If you try to uh, let the finance oligarchs who created the crisis turn around and say they're the doctors who are going to get you out of the crisis, they will dig you deeper and deeper into the bottomless abyss of world economic depression, financial collapse, and disintegration. The Democrats have really done more to destabilize the American economy and to help the big banks on Wall Street than the Republicans have done. I would imagine that the Republicans know a little bit more about finance and markets enough that when someone like Goldman Sachs asks the Congress to change laws as they did in the 90s to do away with position limits on the futures contracts, the Republicans would have said, no way, that's completely inconsistent with any notion of a fair market. But the Democrats, I have a feeling, are just not financially literate enough to say no. And I think that Goldman has very shrewdly positioned themselves with the Democrats because the Democrats typically, like many NGOs that I've run into, they seem to have a, a complete inability to comprehend these issues of markets and finance and how it relates to social justice. So under the Democrats, we also saw the repeal of Glass-Steagall. Glass-Steagall said there's an inherent conflict of interest between the commercial banking side, which is the lending side, and the investment banking side, which is taking an ownership position. And we have to end this conflict of interest by separating these two entities. You can have investment banks and you can have commercial banks, but they have to be separate. Do you think that the repeal of Glass-Steagall was a tragic mistake? Uh, no, I don't think so. You could be a commercial bank, like Chase Manhattan, or you could be an investment house, like J.P. Morgan, or a bank like Bank of America, or an investment house like Merrill Lynch. But you couldn't be both. And as the 90s went on, the, the screaming uh, hyenas of Wall Street were demanding that this prohibition, this regulation, be abolished. This was an illegal and inappropriate form of casino. The derivatives were being used, and they were being unregulated, and the people were getting 30 to 1, 40 to 1, 50 to 1, and sometimes 100 to 1 profits on the way up. And remember, derivatives are a zero-sum game. So there's nothing there. It's not like a piece of stock in, in General Electric or Ford or something like that where there's supposed to be some value. Derivatives have no value. But the very people, Summers and, and, and Gettner and all the people at, at Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan who created these things, made not millions or billions, but trillions on the way up. And now that these things are crashing, the very same folks, the very same folks are now put in charge of regulating these things and in charge of the bailout. And they are giving money to the very rascals that created this problem, took the profits. The problem cannot be fixed. And this is on Obama's watch right now. You have so many different uh, 
schemes and mechanisms at play. It's sort of like after there's a blackout, you know, people in some parts of the country have been known to loot the uh, local stores. You know, they go in, they grab the televisions and they grab the stereos. And basically that's what the Wall Street gang has done. They've, they've just uh, engaged in this massive looting of, uh, of, of money from uh, their own companies and, and now from the U.S. Treasury. There was a lady called Brooksley Bourne. She was the head of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission under Clinton. And she said, look, we have these derivatives. Why don't we at least make them reportable so we know how many there are and where, where they are? And she writes uh, in a, a biographical account, she said, I picked up the phone and Larry Summers was screaming at me that I was interfering with the wonderful inventiveness and ingenuity of Wall Street and their ability to come up with new financial products, such as these derivatives. Brooksley Bourne was uh, the chair of the Commodities Future Trading Commission, CFTC, um, which regulates many financial derivatives. And she said, there's a grave danger out there in the form of these credit default swaps. Uh, and credit default swaps are a exotic financial derivative, or moderately exotic financial derivative, um, that were sold on a bright shining lie that they were supposed to make markets more efficient. Uh, in fact, they allow utterly insane gambles, and they're really great devices for accounting fraud as well. She actually says, I'm thinking of adopting this regulation. The Clinton administration goes berserk, and in particular, Larry Summers, uh, but also Rubin. Now behind Larry Summers, there's another layer. Bob Rubin of Goldman Sachs, the Clinton administration, and Citibank. And he also thought that derivatives were a wonderful thing for the U.S. economy, and he made sure that they were never regulated. Also, we can't forget Alan Greenspan over at the Federal Reserve. Now, you look at Summers, he is sitting in the White House today, making policy for Obama. Summers tells Obama what to do, Summers tells Geithner what to do. He's also got some of his hatchet people in the administration. Mary Shapiro runs the Securities and Exchange Commission. She refuses to ban uh, naked short selling and other market manipulations. You've also got another guy called Gensler over at the Commodity Futures Trading Commission today. He is an acolyte and a supporter of the derivatives bubble. We made the new CFTC chair a guy who had helped to kill Brooksley Bourne's reform initiatives. And, and we just did this under the Obama administration. This was a pre-registered, pre-organized, predetermined event. Anybody who knows that if you allow the banks to become unregulated financial institutes with tsunami-like, weapons of mass destruction-like financial instruments like derivatives, to allow that to run up to levels that are 50, 100, 200 times the gross domestic product with no value, they know that they are taking the profits on going up, but they also know that the end result is the destruction and gutting of this economy. The scam is simple. The insiders buy hard assets and political influence as the fiat bubbles expand. And then, at a time of their choosing, they purposefully implode the bubble. You've got a very small group of people and the Federal Reserve and the global central banking system and the Bank of International Settlements in Switzerland who are purposefully managing the boom and bust, credit supply, credit contraction, money supply growth, money supply contraction to create artificial roller coasters and artificial volatility that they can trade around without taking any risk. It doesn't cost them any money. And if they do make a mistake because they're, as George Bush said, oh, the bankers on Wall Street are drunk. It is uncertain. There's no question about it. Wall Street got drunk. One reason I should turn off the TV cameras. <laughs> Let's say they walk in one day, they push the wrong button, and they lose the bank a billion or five billillion or a hundred billion, they can appeal to the government to bail them out. It's a totally asymmetric relationship between bankers and the rest of the economy. If they make a mistake, they get bailed out. If everyone else makes a mistake, they get put in jail, call the terrorists, and we never hear from them again. But it's a more sophisticated form of slavery, and we're going through it today. We see the taxation is going up all the time with the, with the supposed crash of the banks that was not 
uh, a happening out of the blue. It was set up for this time. They could have kept it going for another few years if it suited them, and then crashed all the bubbles. But now is the time, as they say in their own writings, now is the time. One of the great benefits of an economic model from an economist standpoint is you can basically get whatever results you want. Uh, you can manipulate the inputs to make that happen. And that makes it a, a very easy tool to use to hoodwink other people. These manufactured, these engineered financial catastrophes are the result of a central banking system that has the ability to add and subtract credit, add and, sub add and subtract dollars and money at will to create this roller coaster effect. Because unlike most people, the, the banks are able to make profits as easily on the way down as they can on the way up in any given situation. Volatility is great for banks and professionals. Volatility is not great for the, um, the most, uh, most average people. Their operatives in government and media then hold the economy hostage by issuing the ultimatum. Give us unlimited bailout money or the economy dies. What's being used is what I call, to try to get the money, is what I call the suicide uh, threat, uh, where, you know, if you, anybody has ever seen the movie Blazing Saddle, the sheriff is surrounded by hostile town folks. He takes out his gun, points it at his head and says, you know, don't move or I'll shoot. Well, that's what the big banks are saying. You know, give us unlimited cash or we'll die. And if we die, you'll die because we're too big to fail. It is a false flag attack because Hank Paulson will get up in front of Congress and say, we need $700 billion because that thing, that existential threat, the market is attacking us and we need this handout to fight Mr. Market. Mr. Market is out there. We need to fight Mr. Market. It's an existential threat. Meanwhile, he's the one, he is Mr. Market. He's the one causing the problem. We had Paulson, a representative of Goldman Sachs, who happened to be running the U.S. Treasury, came forward with a hysterical briefing for the Congress, saying we, the Wall Street bankers, demand $700 billion in bailouts. So they say, yes, we'll give you all the money you need. Well, why, you know, these are arsonists. Paulson, uh, Tim, Tim Geithner, Bernanke, they're arsonists. They're asking for more matches. And the Congress is saying, who do we make the check out to? Who do we send these matches to? Who do, who, do, who do we send the matches to? Is a ton of matches enough? Can we send you some gasoline to go with those matches? They're like, yes, please. Don't change our management. Don't pay us what assets are worth. Pay us way more than what our assets are really worth. Don't make us use honest accounting. Allow us to lie. We've just, under congressional pressure, changed the accounting rules for the express purpose of making sure that the big banks don't have to report honest losses. The only way they can pass this bill is by creating and sustaining a panic atmosphere. That atmosphere is not justified. Many of us were told in private conversations that if we voted against this bill on Monday, that the sky would fall, the market would drop two or 3,000 points the first day, another couple thousand the second day, and a few members were even told that there would be martial law in America if we voted no. That's what I call fear-mongering. We have, uh, you know, people in the government threatening martial law or things to, to get their way in the executive branch uh, against Congress. Uh, you know, it, it, you, you know, if you put all these signs together, it, it doesn't look good at all. That, um, to the extent we are a democracy, we're sort of a hairbreadth away from a police state. Congress aided the bankers in carrying out the biggest heist in history with the so-called banker bailout of 2008. The bailout money, the 13 trillion or so dollars that have been given to the banks is sitting on the balance sheet of the banks and that is incurring interest costs and that's going to precipitate the need to flush the system with more cash and at some point the dam will break and you're going to have very high inflation, some predict hyperinflation. You cannot print phantom money out of thin air, backed by nothing and producing practically nothing without destroying the world economy. So unless we cut out the toxic funds, the toxic elements of this economy, every time we put in money on this bailout, it's just feeding the fire. It's not making things better. What should have happened 
is that those banks and investment banks should have been seized. They should have been seized by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Those are zombie banks. The uh, Chase Manhattan, J.P. Morgan Chase, Bank of America, Citibank, Wells Fargo, Wachovia, so on down the line, to AIG in the insurance realm. These are zombie institutions, insolvent, bankrupt. The only thing to do with them is to seize them, put them through Chapter 11 bankruptcy. That'll probably turn into Chapter 7 bankruptcy, liquidation. And above all, triage the derivatives on their books. There's no way to bail out a $1.5 quadrillion black hole of derivatives. But nevertheless, they tried. They will, of course, try to regain some of this money back. But their debts, unlike any other period in history, are now a quantum size bigger than the entire global GDP by a factor of 50 to 100. It's, it's almost infinite amount of debt. If you really look at the numbers because of the massive, massive debt, and right now, total debt in this country is about 375% of the gross domestic product. And that's not including derivatives. If you put the derivatives in, it's probably 20 to 30 times gross domestic product. It's beyond what anybody has ever even considered. While they were looting North America into the ground, the international banking syndicate was simultaneously executing the same scam in over 100 other nations. So who got the money? To financial institutions in, in Europe and other countries. Which ones? I don't know. Half a trillion dollars and you don't know who got the money? Well, Obama's got uh, one difficulty with this Congress. It's the number of freshman Democrats that got elected. Uh, many of these people know that they got their seats from, and, and many of which uh, uh, got seats in, in uh, the Senate and Congress from uh, long-held Republican seats. They know that the, the people back in their states and in, in their constituencies will not tolerate this any longer. So. Uh, up against the Republicans and the Blue Dog Democrats are these freshman congressmen, uh, Democratic congressmen and senators, and they're not, uh, they don't seem like they want to go along with the program. So if there's any hope, it'll come from these freshmen. The Constitution says, no money shall be drawn from the Treasury, but in consequence of appropriations made by law. This Do you money think is not drawn from the Treasury. That, well, let's talk about that. Do you think it's consistent with the spirit of that provision of the Constitution for a group like the FMOC to hand out a half a trillion dollars to foreigners without any action by this Congress? Congress approved it in the Federal Reserve Act. When was that? Quite a long time ago. I don't know the exact date. Uh, 19, years ago? The Federal Reserve Act is 1914, I believe. I, I don't know whether this provision was in 1914 or not, but the Federal Reserve Act was in 1913. All right, and at that time, the entire gross national product of this country was well under half a trillion dollars, wasn't it? I don't know. Is it safe to say that nobody in 1913 contemplated that your small little group of people would decide to hand out half a trillion dollars to foreigners? What the bailout legislation really did was give a blank check backed up by U.S. taxpayers to offshore mega banks. Of course, uh, uh, Congress has oversight. If, if you read the uh, Constitution, our founders were very clear, anything to do with taxes and money is put into the hands of both houses of Congress together. Both houses of Congress together must approve it. Uh, because it's a buck, because that's why we fought the revolution. Taxation without representation was part of it. Foreign banks, Société Générale of France, about 10 billion for a French bank, Deutsche Bank of Germany. Did Deutsche Bank need the money? How much did they get from the bailout? Well, they told us they got 12 billion from the bailout. And Barclays Bank of Britain, 10 billion. So you're up to almost $50 billion to bail out a series of foreign banks that were derivatives counterparties of AIG, plus Goldman Sachs. This is the biggest swindle, not only in the history of the United States, this is the biggest swindle and transfer of wealth in the history of the Western countries. And we've seen all these cronies from Wall Street uh, with the combination to the vaults around the country and they've uh, just looted uh, the treasury and the banks and, and uh, the securities industry dry. This is 
by probably an order of magnitude the biggest fraud in, in history. Over the next 10 months, 23.7 trillion was stolen from the U.S. Treasury. The gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. McHenry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, uh, the tune of 23 trillion 700 billion dollars worth of taxpayer exposure for the bailouts is quite striking. The calculation right now is that with Obama, we've got 24 trillion dollars as a line of credit available only to Wall Street banks, insurance companies, credit cards, uh, mutual fund companies, and others, but only financial institutions. $24 trillion of money from the Federal Reserve, from the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, and from the Treasury in the form of the bailout of October 2008. The Federal Reserve, the private holding company for the offshore banks, arrogantly told Congress and the American people that it was none of their business what the private banks did with the people's money. Uh, one very interesting exchange, Senator Bernie Sanders of Vermont asking Bernanke, we have given upwards of $2 trillion to various financial institutions. You've got to tell me, where did the money go? And Bernanke simply stonewalls and says, I won't tell you. And who got the money? Hundreds and hundreds of banks, any bank or, that has uh, access to the U.S. Uh, Federal Reserve's discount. Can tell us who they are. No. Do you have to be a large, greedy, reckless financial institution to apply for these monies? There is no subsidy. There is no capital involved. There is no gift involved. It is a collateralized, short-term liquid loan that is both over-collateralized and is recourse to the company itself. We have never lost a penny doing it. And how can other institutions make, get, get uh, those loans as well? According to the law, we are supposed to be lending to depository institutions. Let me just say this, Mr. Chairman. I have a hard time understanding how you have put $2.2 trillion at risk uh, without uh, making those names available, those institutions public. And we're going to introduce legislation today, by the way, to demand that you do that. It is unacceptable to me that that goes on. Behind me, the Federal Reserve uh is probably the least transparent agency in the federal government. One could even argue that the Central Intelligence Agency is more transparent than the Federal Reserve. The fact is, is that the American people want to know more of the secrets of the temple, as the book was uh, before you were born, the secrets of the temple. <laughs> the Fed, as you know, is just a monopoly by the bankers. This is simply putting the foxes in charge of the hen house. Personally, I'd be in favor of Congress just nationalizing the Fed and, and getting the bankers out of there. They're, they're, you know, they're just stealing from the American people, put it directly in the hands of Congress and, and let Congress decide, uh, rather than this cabal of uh, bankers deciding their own rates of profit uh, at the expense of the American people. Since the Federal Reserve's creation in 1913, patriots have labored tirelessly to alert the American people to the true nature of the Federal Reserve. Throughout its 90-plus year history, most Americans falsely believed that the Federal Reserve was a government agency. But today, scientific opinion polls show that the vast majority of the public is aware of the fact that the Federal Reserve is a front company for an offshore private banking cartel that dominates not just the United States, but almost every other nation on Earth. It's never been written about in any book that I have found as to who gave these guys the authority or permission to be the international bankers for the world. Why would you even need international bankers? Why would any government agree to, to use them? Why would you need to use them? Why can't any country create its own money? It tells you there was already an existing superstructure, already in, in existence, maybe two, three hundred years ago, to give these guys permission to somehow be the overlords of all money for all countries. Polls also reveal that 75% of Americans demand a public audit of the secretive organization. By the summer of 2009, Congressman Ron Paul's bill to audit the Fed had gained more than 280 sponsors in the House. 
but the private Fed's high-powered lobbyists were able to block a vote on the bill in the Senate. That only piqued the public's interest. I have another amendment. Um, I have been informed by the, that the majority plans to block consideration of uh, this amendment, which is number 1367, regarding the transparency at the Federal Reserve. Madam President, I'd like to call up Amendment 1367. Without objection, the clerk will report. The Senator from South Carolina, Mr. DeMint, proposes an amendment number 1367. Senator from Nebraska. I make a point of order against the DeMint amendment that it's legislation on appropriations. Madam President. The point of order is well taken. The amendment. I, I regret the objection. The amendment falls. The people began asking themselves, why couldn't there be an audit of the Federal Reserve? The Fed has never once been audited. In the whole period of time, in the almost 90 some odd years that the Fed has been around, the most powerful agency and independent agency, it has never once been audited. This is an absolute crime against the freedoms of this country. Do you think it would cause pr uh, problems for the Fed or for the economy if, if that uh, legislation was to pass? My concern about the legislation is that if the G GAO is auditing not only the operational aspects of our programs and the details of the programs, but is making judgments about our policy decisions, that would effectively be a takeover of monetary policy by the Congress. Is that your position that uh, uh, this bill, if it were to be passed, would interfere uh, directly with uh, interest rates? setting interest rates? If we were to raise interest rates at a meeting and someone in the Congress didn't like that and said, I want the GAO to audit that decision, wouldn't that be viewed as an interference? I, w I wouldn't think so. This is just reviewing it and you can do what you want. The Federal Reserve has never been subjected to an outside audit. And if you audit them, it's very likely that Greenspan, Bernanke, and Volcker might all go to jail. It was announced today, earlier today, that there will be a hearing on H.R. 1207, the bill to audit the Federal Reserve Bank. This will be the first independent audit in the Federal Reserve's 96-year history, and it's long overdue. Months ago, I asked the Vice Chairman of the Federal Reserve, who received the $1 trillion in funds that the Federal Reserve has handed out to domestic institutions? He said, I'm not going to tell you. And then more recently, the Chairman of the Federal Reserve, I asked him, who receives the half trillion, we're talking about $500 billion that the Federal Reserve handed over to foreign central banks. Who did they disseminate that money to? And he said, I don't know. Half a trillion dollars and he doesn't know. It's long overdue. We need to audit the Federal Reserve and I'm happy to say that that's, we're going to have a hearing on that very soon. The only way, really, America can get out of the current mess is you've got to shut the Fed down completely. Get rid of the Fed. You've got to put the money printing mechanism back under the roof of the federal government instead of outsourcing it to the Fed. Why were the bank's front men, Alan Greenspan and Ben Bernanke, all over the news saying that they were above the law? What is the uh, proper relationship, what should be the proper relationship between a chairman of the Fed and a president of the United States? There is no ag other agency of government which can overrule actions that we take. What the relationships are uh, don't frankly matter. A grassroots movement demanding that the private Federal Reserve be nationalized exploded in size across the country. The momentum had shifted. Now the arrogant central bankers were the ones running scared. They had planned to use their stage crisis to bring in an all-powerful central bank of the world. Immediately every country goes into action at the same time. Uh, the, the International Monetary Fund is mentioned at the G20 meeting. They say that it must be brought to its full power. And we need a Bretton Woods Part Two for world taxation. What is global government? For decades, the media denied it existed. But now they're saying, oh yes, there's going to be a global government, a new bank of the world, and we're going to pay our carbon taxes to it. What is it? It's nothing more than a private, hostile, corporate takeover of every sovereign nation on earth. And then when you look at the philosophy of these global corporate chieftains, it is one of domination of the poor, 
domination of the population. It is a view that human life just isn't cheap. No, human life is a negative. And so no matter what they do, they have the rationale that it's in the greater interest to get rid of more human lives. They are so arrogant and, and they're so sure of themselves, they're saying, yes, we created the European Union, we created the Euro, and this is our, from the people of the Bilderberg. We are going to create a world bank. We're going to create a world government. They're saying it out loud and clearly. Suddenly, across the planet, their regional front banks had been identified by sovereign populations as the illegitimate shadow governments that they are. The controllers had moved too quickly and revealed their hand. Populations around the globe were seeing through the establishment's facade, past the puppet governments, and to the global architects that were pulling their strings. Where are the American people? Why have they lost their dignity? What is stopping them from speaking out? Why have they become little mice that follow Pied Pipers? How can they look up to these pathetic politicians? Go sit down. I have a question for this young man. He has the right to be represented. I'm his father, and I want to talk to you face to face. Look at your Why not a lobbyist with all kind of money to stuff in your pocket so that you can cheat the, the pit citizens of this country? So I'll leave, and you can do whatever the hell you please to do. One day, God's going to stand before you, and he's going to judge you and the rest of your damn cronies up on the hill. And then you will get your just desserts. As the public begins to awaken to the fact that Barack Obama has cold-bloodedly betrayed the pledges he made to the American people, the establishment media and Democratic leaders have invoked the tactic of divide and conquer. I think they're astroturf. Uh, oh, you be the judge of carrying swastikas and symbols like that to a, a town meeting on health care. An overwhelming portion of the intensely demonstrated animosity toward President uh, Barack Obama is based on the fact that he is a black man. Desperate to ram their agenda through. They have played the race and class cards. You start to wonder whether, in fact, the word socialist is becoming a code word, whether or not socialist is becoming the new N-word. When I heard people going after the first lady and the number right. of staff people they have, it sounds racist to me. It is essential that the establishment play the population off against each other, along the lines of Republican Democrat, liberal conservative, black and white. As long as the people are fighting with each other, they can never get together and remove the corporate dictatorship that has criminally seized power through the national security state. Just as George W. Bush betrayed his foolish followers, so must Obama, because his only allegiance is to his offshore masters. President Obama today nominated Ben Bernanke for a second four-year term as Federal Reserve Chairman. The president called his actions on the global financial crisis bold and out of the box. As an expert on the causes of the Great Depression, I'm sure Ben never imagined that he would be part of a team responsible for preventing another. But because of his background, his temperament, his courage, and his creativity, that's exactly what he has helped to achieve. And that is why I am reappointing him to another term as chairman of the Federal Reserve. So Obama has made it quite clear by his actions, never mind his words, his actions as to who owns him, who, who he works for, and who he serves, and it's not the American people. It is so obvious to anyone paying attention that the President of the United States is not the real person in control whether it is Gerald Ford or Jimmy Carter or Ronald Reagan or, or Clinton or Bush or Bush, Obama is no different. And to think that he is an independent figure is just crazy. And as Franklin Delano Roosevelt said, presidents are selected, they are not elected. Obama pledged that he would end NAFTA and GATT and has since fought to expand both of them. 
Obama promised that he would have the most transparent administration ever, and he is already more secretive than Bush and Cheney ever were, even making it a secret who visits the White House. I can make a firm pledge. If your family earns less than $250,000 a year, if you make less than a quarter million dollars a year, if you are a family making two, less than $250,000 a year, you will not see your taxes increased a single dime. You will not see your taxes go up. You will not see your taxes increase one single dime. Not your capital gains tax, not your payroll tax, not your income tax, no tax. Not your income tax, not your payroll tax, not your capital gains taxes, not any of your taxes. Not your payroll tax, not your capital gains tax, not your income tax, no tax. Your taxes will not go up because the last thing you need is higher taxes when we're in a recession like this and you won't get one under an Obama administration. Obama made the centerpiece of his campaign, the pledge that taxes would not be raised on anyone making under $125,000 a year. He has since gone back on that promise as well and has proposed new taxes on payroll, energy, home mortgage deductions, and scores of other taxes. He made a pledge. He said, I'm not going to raise taxes on anyone making under 250. Mm -hmm. Is that pledge still active? Uh, we are going to let the process work its way through it. So it's not. So it's not. So it's not. We're going to let the process <laughs> work its way through. All right. The Senate uh, is looking, especially at this issue of, of capping the deductions uh, for, for health care that employers and employees uh, now get. That would, <coughs> it would be a incre tax increase for many families earning under $250,000. But the president said he was open to it. So that means that the tax pledge he made back in September is no longer operative? Obama said he was going to abolish the Patriot Act. He now vigorously defends it. We saw the same type of flip-flop when it came to warrantless wiretapping of the American people. Look what Obama's done with wiretapping, surveillance. He's brought it to heights even beyond what George Bush, the disgusting levels that he brought it to. So we have more surveillance. Now they're talking about what is it called? Cybercom, the new Pentagon secret cyber society that's going to be watching over us to get those terrorists. We gotta get those terrorists. So now they'll be invading our privacy even more. So, I mean, it really, it really almost makes you ask the question, would it have been better if we never invented the internet and had to use paper and pencil or whatever? Now Obama is setting up the Cybersecurity Command which the government admits completely ends the Fourth Amendment and allows President Obama to shut off the internet in the United States whenever he wishes. Indeed, in today's world, acts of terror could come not only from a few extremists in suicide vests, but from a few keystrokes on the computer, a weapon of mass disruption. As part of the new single national security staff announced this week, I'm creating a new office here at the White House that will be led by the cybersecurity coordinator. This new control grid is administered by the Pentagon. They just want to keep tabs on us. So we're turning in to a surveillance wiretapped government state. The government is taking more and more control over our lives. I can stand here today as president of the United States and say without exception or equivocation that we do not torture. Obama made a show of investigating torture, but has ignored the Army's own detailed investigative reports, which name the tortures that the White House memos document were following the directives of Bush and Cheney, the men who are most guilty for issuing the infamous orders. Some low-level soldiers have been prosecuted for their role at Abu Ghraib, but no senior officer has been held accountable in any of these cases to date. Heidi? I know that these debates lead directly, in some cases, to a call for a fuller accounting, perhaps through an independent commission. Now, I've opposed the creation of such a commission. Next, Obama expanded Bush's doctrine of indefinite detention of foreigners without trial to holding citizens without evidence indefinitely, without ever even committing a crime. President Obama today proposed something new, something called prolonged detention. 
Pre-crime is where people are arrested and incarcerated to prevent crimes that they have not yet committed. Barack H. Obama, who ran as an anti-war candidate, has continued the war in Iraq, massively expanded the war in Afghanistan, and unleashed a new conflict in Pakistan. Now Obama is promoting the biggest defense budget in history, dwarfing George Bush's war machine. What George Bush has been trying to do as part of his effort to accumulate more power in the presidency is he's been saying, well, I can basically change what Congress passed by attaching a letter saying, I don't agree with this part or I don't agree with that part. I'm going to choose to interpret it this way or that way. Uh, that's not part of his power. But this is part of the whole theory of George Bush that he can make laws as he's going along. Uh, I disagree with that. I taught the Constitution for 10 years. I believe in the Constitution and I will obey the Constitution of the United States. We're not going to use signing statements as a way of doing an end run around Congress. All right? Obama guaranteed that once president, he would stop the unconstitutional practice of issuing signing statements, through which the executive branch illegally usurps the legislative power of Congress. Congressman Kucinich, when he introduced his uh, 60 uh, uh, articles of impeachment against Bush uh, Jr., I think one was the signing statements. The form of the resolution is as follows. A resolution, articles of impeachment, of George Bush, President of the United States, resolved that President George W. Bush be impeached for high crimes and misdemeanors. Article 26, announcing the intent to violate laws with signing statements and in violation of his constitutional duty under Article 2, Section 3 of the Constitution to take care that the laws be faithfully executed, has used signing statements to claim the right to violate acts of Congress even before he signs those acts into law. Same analysis would uh, uh, apply uh, to Obama and a fortiori because he taught constitutional law. He knows better. He's a lawyer licensed to practice law, who, as I am, who took an oath when he was licensed to uphold the Constitution and laws of the United States of America. With his signature on the spending bill also came Obama's first signing statement, a presidential declaration freeing him from following some of the bill's contents. I believe in the Constitution and I will obey the Constitution of the United States. We're not going to use signing statements as a way of doing an end run around Congress. All right? He also promised that he would call on Congress to take at least five days to read new legislation before it was voted on. When there's a bill that ends up on my desk as president, you, the public, will have five days to look online and find out what's in it before I sign it. So that you know what your government's doing. But from his first day in power, he has aggressively pressured Congress to quickly pass bills before lawmakers and the public even have a chance to see them. I will state his parliamentary inquiry. Uh, Madam Speaker, in order to try to figure out what we're doing, how much damage the country, I tried to get a copy of the bill. We have out here on the table 2454 that has 1,090 pages in it, but I've understood since debate in here that there's another 300 pages that were added in the middle of the night. My inquiry is, how do I get a copy of the other 300 pages that people on here, on here uh, or here on the floor I hadn't had a chance to read or see? Where, where do we get that before we slam this, cram this down on the American people? Is there somewhere physically in the House of Representatives a copy of what we're voting on? The gentleman has not stated a parliamentary inquiry that the, that the chair can answer. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I have to say that I am outraged. Here we are getting ready to vote on a piece of legislation, and we haven't even seen 300 pieces of this legislation. No one can even find the bill or even knows where it's at. 
Obama swore that he would never put lobbyists or donors in his administration. Treasury Secretary Timothy Geithner appointed Mark Patterson, and this is a former top lobbyist for Goldman Sachs as his chief of staff. And then last week, there was a lot of buzz over William Lynn. He was the, appointed to the number two position at the Defense Department. William Lynn, also a former top lobbyist for Raytheon, which is a, uh, a, one of the five largest defense contractors. He has now broken all previous records by cramming his administration full of contributors and lobbyists who openly write legislation being proposed by the White House. There's a good reason Obama doesn't want to give the people or Congress any time to read the bills. I'm still needing a copy of the other 300 mysterious pages that we don't get to see here. Shortly after the 2008 election, Vice President Joe Biden confided to top supporters that it was essential that their program be implemented at lightning speed. Because their agenda was so unpopular, they knew Obama would lose support quickly. Obama's handlers were in a race to pass a raft of legislation before the people discovered that Obama was just a slicker, updated version of previous puppets. Obama is the New World Order's closer. It's his job to repackage and solidify the tyrannical policies of George W. Bush as progressive and trendy. So part of my job, I think, as president is to make government cool again. Chris Hedges, author of Empire of Illusion, explained it succinctly. President Obama does one thing, and brand Obama gets you to believe another. This is the essence of successful advertising. You buy or do what the advertiser wants because of how they make you feel. Through Obama, the global establishment are now putting their entire program into high gear. Obama is attempting to dismantle the Second Amendment with more than a dozen victim disarmament bills now in Congress. The key is going to be, I think, for us to come together and say people do have an individual right and there's nothing wrong with common sense gun laws. Hate crime and cyberbullying bills in the House and Senate would effectively criminalize free speech protected under the First Amendment. It is absolutely true that NAFTA was a mistake. A senior member of the Obama campaign called the Canadian government within the last month to say that when Senator Obama talks about opting out of the free trade deal, the Canadian government shouldn't worry. The operative said it's just campaign rhetoric and don't take it seriously. <laughs> This, uh, the Canadian government put out a statement indicating that this was just not true. So I don't know who the sources. It wasn't true. Amid all of the denials, sources at the highest level of the Canadian government who first confirmed that a call was made, late this afternoon, reconfirmed that a call was made. President Obama is promoting the creation of a North American Union and is attempting to expand NAFTA and GATT. President Obama is pushing nation-ending blanket amnesty for more than 20 million foreign aliens living illegally inside the United States. He's also overseeing the hijacking of health care by the federal government, which will nationalize more than 20% of the U.S. economy. And you want us to believe that a government that can't even run a cash for clunkers program is going to run one-seventh of our U.S. economy. No, sir. Obama is continuing the transfer of national sovereignty to unelected international bodies like the United Nations and World Trade Organization. And most important of all, under the cover of banking reform, Obama wants to hand dictatorial power over the United States economy to an offshore private banking cartel known as the Bank of the World. Richard, what happened to all those threats from France's president about storming out and, and, and about having a global regulator uh, who was going to reach across borders and be able to, 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 to deal with markets no matter what country they were in? They have opened up the idea of there being some form of other regulator across countries, and I think that's going to come So back. is this some sort of new world order, which, which Gordon oh, Brown kind of alluded to? I think a new world order is emerging, and with it the foundations of a new and progressive era of international cooperation. The finance heads of the 20 industrialized nations met again in late September of 2009 at the G20 summit in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. At that meeting, ministers called for an end to the dollar as the world reserve currency. They also called for a strengthening 
of global governance and called for a new world order. While the bankers were busy carving up the world at the G20 summit, Barack Obama was in New York City at the United Nations because he's got a new job to chair the United Nations Security Council, the most powerful position in the world government body. President Obama does what no other U.S. president ever has. As President Obama presided over the U.N.'s most powerful body. That would be the Security Council. Six. 1,191st meeting of the Security Council. For a couple of hours, you could say Mr. Obama was yes, president of the world. It is the story of a world that understands that no difference or division is worth destroying all that we have built. In my own country, it has brought Democrats and Republican leaders together. Uh, leaders like George Shultz, Bill Perry, Henry Kissinger, and Sam Nunn, who are with us here today. Barack Obama is the first president to hold two posts simultaneously. And there's a good reason for that. It's illegal. Article 1, Section 9 of the Constitution forbids any U.S. president from serving any foreign government or institution. He swears an oath to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. But now Barack Obama has sworn allegiance to the global government and the United Nations that he heads up. Let that sink in real good. Barack Obama now heads the United Nations Security Council. You cannot serve two masters, and Obama isn't. He's selling out the last vestiges of sovereignty that this country had. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the destruction of our nation, and it's also high treason. Obama's lies are obvious and out in the open. He hides in plain sight. And from the moment he took office, his lies have only increased. Despite the fact that his ratings have dramatically dropped since election day, from the mid 80s to the low 40s, a large portion of Americans still gullibly hang on his every word. It is bringing entertainment to thousands of people. Through its magic, we are able to enjoy a combination of the radio, motion pictures, and the stage, right in the comfort of our own home simply by pushing a button and turning a dial. These cells with their electrical charges are scanned by a stream of electrons, completing 30 pictures a second. Compare that crude picture with these of today, and you can judge for yourself how far along the road to perfection television has traveled. Most people still today think that all entertainment uh, to do with movies, drama, is, is, is there for nothing more than their entertainment. It never, ever was that case. Of course, television can't perform such miracles as this, yet. But perhaps there's no harm wishing that it could. The greatest social, social med, uh, messages are promoted through movies and drama, high drama, through the fixation of emotive sequences, emotional sequences, not logical, factual sequences, but pushing points across in an emotion, emotional way which register and fix in the mind. So emotional content is very, very important rather than going through an actual discussion or an argument using logic and facts. There's no debate. And when you're being downloaded through fiction, your guard is down, the sensor part of your brain is not in, uh, in action. It isn't saying, yes, I agree with this, I disagree with that, as you would in a debate or a lecture. You're actually in an alpha state, being completely downloaded with new ideas. Throughout history, social engineers have refined techniques designed to control large populations. Uh, about 100 years ago, this big organization with many branches uh, they wanted to rule the world, basically, using Britain as a nucleus of, of a system, an embryo, uh, which also was going to be joined with the U.S. Uh, under the Anglo-American establishment. Uh, wrote about the kind of culture and the changes of culture over a hundred year period that they would actually design, implement and bring in. And um, H.G. Wells talked about it too. He talked about arenas. He says arenas could be put up across the world for sports, for instance. Now at that time, sports was something that children, uh, school children were into. Adults became adults and got onto adult things. So it was unimaginable at the time that people could actually believe that uh, 
there was even a need for adult sports and entertainment, never mind having ar arenas built across the world. But he said, we can do this. And you know, voiced basically a sports culture for the males. Using a tribal system, we're all tribal to an extent. That's why we even bother to vote for a tribal leader. Uh, this is well understood. That's why we're supplied with these leaders. And because the, the average man was to become more disengaged from his own destiny, as the expert class arose, it was decided that, that the males would get their, their, their outlet, basically, um, being gradually becoming helpless as, as males through sports. Therefore, they'd have a tribal team they could identify with, uh, they could um, cheer them on as they were winning, in their own personal lives, they were getting nowhere. They were getting disenfranchised, in a sense, as experts took over um, decision-making for them in all kinds of fields. So this was psychology at use, uh, planned before they even implemented the sports. Um, when radio came along, of course, they, they, they used that to the maximum. Uh, sports for the men, um, soaps basically for the women. And then in came television, as I say, with its alpha state, its hypnotic state. And sure enough, around the 1960s, really, 50s and 60s, it took off. It really, really took off. Uh, and men became glued on Saturday nights to the sports shows. A culture industry, which is called by its own the culture industry. The Soviet Union had a department called the culture industry. Their actors and directors were called the cultural leaders. Leaders. Because they would, like a computer, people are like computers, um, all you have to do is keep giving them new updates every so often and you can change an entire country or a nation or a block of nations who are all getting the same uploads, upgrades at the same time along certain paths. Today we call it political correctness. Most people want to belong to their peer group. They want to be the same as everyone else when it comes to opinions. In fact, they judge their own personal sanity by bouncing ideas off their, their neighbors and friends who will answer back and agree on these same topics in kind. It doesn't matter if the topics or, the, or what you're given are facts or, or utter nonsense, as long as everyone agrees at the same time, you'll say, well, I'm sane, and your friends will all agree because they've had the same information given to them. But they've been programmed, and I, I'm sad because I know that it's hard for people like that, to take an interest, a serious interest in world affairs, to take a serious interest in what their elected officials are doing, and they're not going to be really inclined to study uh, or discover the deception that's being used against them. And so I'm sad because I, I see all of that in a flash in my mind as being an indication of how easy it is for the masses to be manipulated. The scientific dictatorship understands what makes human beings tick. They understand our psychology. They've studied it and they're using it against us. But the minute the public awakens to the fact that there is an agenda to manipulate them, and the second the public realizes that they are being conditioned and controlled, the establishment begins to lose that edge they've got over people. So all I ask viewers to do is to think for themselves and to study public relations, to study advertising, to study propaganda, and to realize how much of it is out there in their daily lives. And then make the decision for yourself. I just want people to think on their own and to not have their decisions and their thoughts and their ideas uh, prepackaged and basically downloaded into them. If it's on TV and a famous face uh, says something, then it must be true. He doesn't have to show you facts or anything else. You'd, You've been brought up with these faces. That's why they keep these guys on television into their 70s and 80s. You've grown up with this father figure who's on television every night at 6 o'clock uh, in your house, in your room, staring right at you. Uh, and he's a father figure. Would he tell you a lie? That, that, so you naturally never suspect him. And this same man will lead you through new topics. He'll, he'll introduce experts on the topics They'll have a little summary at the end of every talk and you are now left with the conclusion that's presented to you. As you, you don't arrive at it, it's given to you and it's good enough for you.
When I was growing up, people were talking on their front porches, neighbors were playing baseball, there were nightly barbecues. You don't see that anymore. We've lost our communities. You drive through neighborhoods, you see the blue glow of television sets. We're losing our humanity. So if you want to rebel against the globalists, the social engineers, start by turning the TV off a few hours a day and actually getting to know your neighbors, getting outside that comfort zone, expanding your horizons. By coming together as communities, by getting to know our neighbors, we defeat the social engineers. We're programmed today uh, perfectly just like machines. We tie this, this in with the Brzezinski. Brzezinski said in two ages, now this guy was way up with the NSA. He was a, he's a master geopolitician. Uh, he works, in, he admits he works in, in 20, 50 year periods to do with geopolitics in other countries. But he said himself, the public will shortly be unable to think or reason for themselves. It was meaning by the, the form that, that of, of, of uh, information that was given to them, the type, the, the formulas that were in use then in the 1970s. He says, eventually they'll be unable to think or reason for themselves. They, and eventually, he said, they will expect the media uh, to do all their thinking and reasoning for them. Well, that's happened today. Th that's why people today can't think outside of the programming from television. Zbigniew Brzezinski, Obama's main foreign policy advisor, talks about how a cult of personality can be artificially manufactured to influence the masses. In the first months of my administration, uh, to pull our economy... Oh, oh goodness. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. Um, to pull our economy back from the brink, uh, including the largest and most sweeping economic recovery plan in our nation's history. We were gullible, but we're also willingly gullible. We want a human being, a big daddy, to come along and make everything right for us. And as long as we believe that, we'll always basically get shafted. In addition to John, sorry, the, the, uh, I just noticed that uh, I, I jumped the gun here. Go ahead and move it up. I'd already, had, I'd already introduced all you guys. It's the presidential reality show. But when it became an Oprah production, it became slick. You don't have a president, you have an actor. They say that politics is show business for ugly people. You got it. What am I gonna tell the president when I tell him his teleprompter is broken? <laughs> what will he do then? It's Obama's role to front for the international banking syndicate and to take all the heat for their unpopular agenda. It's his job to convince the American people that the buck actually stops at the White House. In Brzezinski's book, Between Two Ages, is that eventually we shall put presidents in who will have personality cults. We shall create massive personality cults for these people through the same techniques as Hollywood has used. Obama is that man today. The globalists, who know that Obama is going to promote their uh, plan, want to make him uh, such a superhero that nobody will question what he's doing. They'll be so preoccupied with who he is, or where he is, or what he's saying, or what he's wearing, or something like that. The idea of making him into a celebrity is very valuable, uh, because that way people are less inclined to ask, what is he doing? So that's very useful to these people. Similar plans of social control have been continuously carried out by operatives of the Ford Foundation, who Obama has worked for over the last 30 years. Many of the strategies used to control populations were originally developed by Edward Bernays, who coined the phrase public relations. Bernays said that if you manufacture an authoritative figure who repeats the same messages over and over, that this will appeal to the masses' subconscious desires Yes, we can. Yes, we can. The unwashed masses will helplessly follow the leader and go along with any message they spout. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Yes, we, can. we shall overcome. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. 
we will respond with that timeless creed that sums up the spirit of a people. Yes, we can. Thank you. Today, these exact techniques are being used with devastating effect against the general population. Obama is the latest version of 21st century mass mind control. The psych warfare engineers are counting on Obama to finish the plan they began decades ago. Beyond their plans to devastate the economy for global consolidation, a new international framework of draconian law is being constructed to establish a system of neo-feudalistic serfdom. Remember, it was Bill Clinton who gave us NAFTA. And it was Al Gore, the hero of the environmental movement, who was the hatchet man for the Clinton administration to cram NAFTA down the throats of a reluctant Congress. Now, this is a good deal for our country, Larry, and let me explain why. Al Gore, who carried the ball for NAFTA and GATT, is now one of the top standard bearers for the elite's agenda. This, I didn't interrupt you. Okay, now, uh, guys. Uh, now, maybe it just... Is this... NAFTA. Why? Huge numbers of manufacturing jobs left Canada, came into the United States because of a 15% wage differential. We pay our workers less in Canada. Now, when you've got a seven to one wage differential between the United States and Mexico, you will hear the giant sucking sound. No, there's a political lesson, uh, there's a business I'm lesson. Sorry. He serves as the front man for the carbon tax cap and trade scheme, which will not only increase taxes on every American, but will also transfer our national sovereignty and rights to a tyrannical world government, all in the name of saving the earth is the legislation that we are discussing here today, is that something that you are going to personally benefit from? If you believe that the reason I have been working on this issue for 30 years is because of greed, you don't know me. I've been willing to put my money where my mouth is. Do you think there's something wrong with being active in business in this country? I am simply asking for clarification I'm proud of, of the it. relationship. I'm proud of it. My name is Dr. Tim Ball. I'm a climatologist. I have a PhD in climatology from the Queen Mary College, the University of London, England. And I've been studying climate both with my nine years in the Canadian Air Force, where it was essential to flying, and then after that at the university. So it's essentially been uh, the whole theme of my career. Initially called climate skeptics, I said, but, but all scientists are skeptics. If you're not a, a skeptic, you're not a scientist. And, and then when that didn't work, then they came out with the charge that we were climate change deniers. And I remember when I was first called a denier, and it was in the Times of London and England. And, um, and of course, the word denier was clearly deliberately chosen because of the Holocaust connotations of that term. So it, it, was, it was not only a, a, a charge that you were ignoring the truth, but you were doing it in, in a very evil way. And uh, of course, I laugh about that now because my whole career has been anything but a climate change denier. I've spent my career trying to educate people to how much climate change is naturally. So I'm anything but a denier, but of course that that uh, is part of the politics. Under the Nazis, there was something called race science. They had a lunatic theory of, of eugenics, the Aryan heritage, and all the rest of this. Absolute crackpot pseudoscience. There was no empirical measure or empirical test for the validity of those theories. They simply asserted them, and if you were a professor who stood up to them, then the Gestapo would come and take you away. We are perilously close to such a situation right now. Any academic, any other figure standing up to say, the global warming theory of Al Gore is a piece of crackpot nonsense is in danger. You'd be fired from a government job and in many universities, your job would be in danger. And of course, it's also part of what's called ad hominem, that if you can't uh, defeat the person's argument rationally, you start attacking the person. And we see that with these terms and we see it with Al Gore calling them flat earthers. Congressman, you began by denying that there is a consensus on the science. 
there is a consensus on the science. Well, you must not have been listening to our testimony that we've had for the last few days with dozens of experts that have come in who have given completely different views. Well, there so are I would, people, I, would I would encourage you to go back and look at the testimony there, this committee's heard. There are people who still believe that the moon landing was staged on a movie lot in Arizona. And neither of us was, are one of those. And I know you like giving those cute anecdotes. This is not a cutesy issue. We're talking about no, something that, that can export millions of jobs out of our economy, out of our country. Richard Lindzen, a, a MIT professor of atmospheric physics, said it many years ago when he said the consensus was reached before the research had even begun. And then scientists like myself that stood up and said, hold on a minute, I got problems with it. Oh, paid by the oil companies. Don't trust that guy. What the international scientific community is saying is correct. There is no legitimate basis for denying it. Now, you hear the consensus argument. Here, well, the majority of scientists. What they're always talking about is, and originally the IPCC was about 3,600 scientists, it's now down to 2,500. That's the people they're talking about. But when you look at it, most of them are bureaucrats. They're not scientists at all. And very, very few of them are actual climate experts. Now, the consequences of that, and whether that's because of man-made CO2, I think are debatable. If CO2 is not causing the climate change, what is? What are the major driving factors? And um, so, they're essentially the ones that are left out by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It, it's unbelievable to me that they can come out and ignore the sun. I mean, everybody knows the sun goes in, it gets cool. You notice that, right? You have an eclipse, the temperature drops, and the birds start to get excited and so on. And, and uh, when you look at the, the seasonal changes with the sun, how you can suggest that the, the sun is not a factor is, is really quite remarkable. Giving us false scientific information is not going to clean up our environment. Speaking with a lot of, of promises and innuendo is not going to help clean up our environment. The globalists have co-opted the environmental movement. There are a lot of real environmental problems we face, like genetic engineering, where they're splicing plants, animals, insects, you name it. Toxic waste dumping in the ocean. No one wants to breathe bad air or drink toxic water. But the global carbon tax has nothing to do with that. It's a tax literally on breathing. Go out on the street or talk to your friends, your neighbors, ask them, hey, should we ban dihydrogen monoxide? It's bad for the environment. The average person will sign your petition calling for the banning of water. That's right. Dihydrogen monoxide is water. It's the same thing with table salt, sodium chloride. And that's exactly what the establishment is doing with carbon dioxide. Ooh, dioxide. It has this scary sounding name. But the truth is, it's one of the four elements of life on this planet. Oxygen, carbon dioxide, water and sunlight and if the establishment can tax and list as a toxic waste one of those basic four building blocks of life carbon dioxide they can regulate and control every facet of our lives and shut down any businesses that aren't part of their new world order the idea that carbon is a pollutant is essentially a way of saying that humanity is a disease or a cancer that ought to be wiped out, genocide. People have argued in this environmental coterie around Obama, around Holdren, the theoretician of de-development who is now the science advisor of the White House, really the anti-science advisor. They've argued that babies are carbon monsters, carbon machines, and that every time you breathe out carbon dioxide, you're part of the pollution of the planet. This is an absolutely anti-human doctrine. They use the environmental movement to promote their real agenda, which is globalization and federalization and power. The advisor to Gordon Brown wants to exterminate one half of the population of the British Isles. Now that's something Hitler might have tried to do, or Stalin. They didn't succeed. Will Gordon Brown do it? You can read this in the statements of these lunatics, radical environmentalists 
fanatical Malthusians, tree huggers, whatever you want to call them. This is an ideology of genocide which can be documented exhaustively, ad nauseum, out of their own statements. When Gore said the science is settled, that raised red flags amongst the media and then also amongst a lot of other people that sort of knew that that wasn't true, other scientists, and started to look at it. And of course, the more they looked at it, the more they realized, um, no, science is never settled. What is coming down now is environmentalism is nothing but phony science. Nothing but phony science. And if we really believe in, in the environment, if we really believe in freedom, if we really believe in truth, we need to get some straight answers. Now, the Kyoto Agreement, of course, uh, was reached in the city of Kyoto. And what was interesting was several things came out of that. But um, the first thing was that not all countries had to participate in Kyoto, but not all had to take action. Only the developed nations were required to reduce their level of CO2. The developing nations were excluded. Now, of course, at that time, China was, and in some ways you can argue it still is, a developing nation. So it wasn't required to meet any targets under Kyoto, nor was India. The U.S., of course, held out. And what's interesting is that the U.S. Senate voted 95 to nothing against the Kyoto Accord, even though Al Gore was the vice president at the time. And uh, lucky for him, he didn't have to cast a, a deciding vote. But um, uh, so it was 95 to nothing against it because the U.S. Senate saw, no, this is, this is a, a socialist distribution of wealth. This is, this is going to cost jobs and economy. And so they scrapped it completely. We're now told that you have to buy carbon offsets. In other words, if you have sinned by having a carbon footprint and by carbon emissions, you've got to buy a carbon offset, which is usually a scam. Somebody claims to have planted an acre of grass in the third world. It never happened. They take your money and laugh all the way to the bank. But they're telling you that in order to cleanse your guilt, you've got to buy a carbon offset. Talk about carbon polluters. You talk about them. It's my understanding that back in 1997, when you were vice president, Enron's CEO, Ken Lay, was involved in discussions with you at the White House about helping develop this type of policy, this trading scheme. And uh, is, that, is that accurate? Is it inaccurate? It's, it's been reported. Uh, I, I, I don't know, but, but I, I met with uh, uh, Ken Lay, as lots of people did, before anybody knew, knew uh, that he was a right. crook. And, and clearly, it, you can see why so many of us are concerned about this type of cap-and-trade energy uh, tax that would be literally turning over this country's I energy economy. I didn't know him economy. well enough to call him Kenny Boy. Well, you, but you knew him well enough to help devise this trading scheme, and obviously we know what Enron and these big guys on, uh, on Wall Street like Goldman Sachs, and I know you've got interest with Goldman Sachs. No. Well, it's, that's been reported. Is that not accurate? No, I, I wish I did. With executives from, the, you're partnered in companies with executives from Goldman Sachs. Well, if you're not. Al Gore has got to be the greatest con artist in modern history. This guy claims he invented the internet. Even though it's on record, he's a liar, and he got away with it. He was the pitch man that successfully sold, as vice president, NAFTA and GATT. This lowered the standard of living in the United States and Mexico and almost completely deindustrialized our country. Now he's saying you should pay him and his private company, set up by Enron, a carbon tax on breathing. Look, if you want to buy Al Gore's propaganda, go ahead. But before you do that, you should at least look into the claims he's making. There was a meeting in the White House in 1998 between Al Gore and uh, Bill Clinton, Ken Lay, and Lord Brown. Okay, well, who were these people? Well, we know the president, the vice president. Ken Lay, of course, was the president of Enron. And Enron was a major, major player in the carbon credit, carbon trading. And, and in fact, stood to make an enormous amount of money out of it. And, and so it was part of of the, I think part of the collapse of, of Enron. And Lord Brown, of course, was the head of the largest oil company in, in the world. And um, they were looking to buy into this, as is happening now, where the energy companies are becoming the big promoters of, oh, we've got to go green, we've got to go to alternate energies, and all of this, uh, this stuff. They saw a business opportunity and leapt onto it, and one that would make them look 
green again. When it came time for the 1200 plus page greenhouse gas emission and carbon legislation to be voted on, the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, would not let the Republicans or even members of her own party see the bill until minutes before the vote. Republican Minority Leader John Boehner engaged in a rare House filibuster and read shocking section after shocking section from the legislation. Now, I really hate to do this, but when you file a 300-page amendment at 3.09 a.m., the American people have a right to know what's in this bill and have a right to know what we're voting on. Page 48. Each building code enforcement department receiving a grant under subsection A shall impanel a code administration and enforcement team consisting of at least one full-time building code enforcement officer, a city planner, and a health planner or similar officer. I can take you uh, to Chickasaw, Mercer County in my district. They don't have one full-time person that works for the village, all right, not one. Look at the mandate on every city, village in America, right here in this bill. So that we're not only gonna tell you what the codes are gonna be, but, but we're gonna tell you how many people you need to hire to enforce this. Page 41, determine any geographic area within the contiguous United States that lacks a federal power marketing agency. Because you know, we can't move power around the country without a federal power marketing agency. We do it today, but we, now we have to have a new government agency to do this. All California housing standards are now going to be imposed on every American community. You don't have the right to, to have your own building standards in your community or in your state. Hell no, the federal government's going to tell you what they are. It quickly became clear why Pelosi and the Democratic leadership were desperate to keep the contents of the bill secret before the vote. Now, because of this underlying bill, the federal government will virtually have control over every aspect of lives for the American people. It is time to stand up and say, we get to choose. We choose liberty or we choose tyranny. It's one of the two. The underlying bill represents the tyranny and the intervention of the federal government. It's our choice. What will we choose today? Will we choose liberty or will we choose tyranny? And I know that we'll be facing the single moms that heard from last summer. They can't afford the gasoline bill. They can't afford the propane. You didn't do a great thing. You hurt some really decent families struggling, trying to make it. And this is going to be their death knell. It breaks my heart. I yield back. It is, of course, a carbon tax on economic activity, farming, manufacturing, real production here inside the United States. It would tend to shut down even those miserable remains of an industrial economy that we still have after the collapse of the Detroit automakers and their related uh, subcontractors and so forth. Every home and business in the United States would be federally regulated and controlled. Mandatory home inspections will be carried out by federal inspectors, and it's all at the expense of the homeowner. In New York, they're called the environmental police. On this day, a surprise visit to a market in Brooklyn's Chinatown. And every day you're not in compliance, you face huge fines. Go to page 235. The secretary may set and collect reasonable inspection fees to cover the cost of inspections required. So number one, they can come in, the federal government can come in, and inspect your house, and send you the bill. And if they find that you're out of compliance with this new federal code, the secretary shall assess a civil penalty for violations of this section. And then further, going to page 236, each day of unlawful occupancy shall be considered a separate violation. We're setting up a global warming Gestapo that can literally come in, and now this new term, unlawful occupancy. So now living in your home is considered unlawful under this bill. This is ludicrous. Worst of all, carbon czars in more than 35 federal agencies are given unlimited dictatorial power to tax all forms of carbon and carbon emissions. The Commissar Green Police openly brag that they will have the power to selectively enforce the new edicts on a case-by-case -case basis. 
It's funny because when I tell people what I do for a living, uh, they, the first response usually is, you're with the environmental police, there is no environment in New York City. With this new power, the Green Mafia can take over the entire economy through selective enforcement. We know, Madam Speaker, that this national energy tax will cost the American people $2 trillion. We know that. We know this was, will result in a loss of 2.5 million jobs every year for the American people. We know that. We know this will result in a reduced standard of living for Americans. We know that. What is the point and what's the benefit? The same central banks that have stolen more than 50 trillion from national treasuries across the planet are now creating a new derivatives fraud through the cap and trade carbon tax system that dwarfs their previous Ponzi schemes. We've just watched a financial meltdown in this country, the likes of which hasn't been seen in some time. Now, if people like credit default swaps, they're really going to like the carbon swaps that are going to occur and the carbon future swaps. We spent a full day in this committee last summer talking about the manipulation of the energy futures market in oil. We're going to create, I fear, another such system that uh, people who are, are, are have a, a, an inclination to react dishonestly to systems are, are going to actually have a, a new opportunity. Is that not a problem? A select group of central banks are lobbying for the same legislation to be passed worldwide. Once the so-called green economy laws are in place, only global megacorporations and their subsidiaries will be allowed to do business. Van Jones, Barack Obama's first green job czar, has stated repeatedly on the record that the new green economy is only a cover for a complete revolution against capitalism and the total redistribution of wealth. But what Van Jones doesn't tell his sad followers is that the elite are bragging that the modern green movement was designed from its creation to destroy the middle class and transfer all wealth into the hands of a super elite. They're not doing this to uplift the poor. No, the goal is to enslave the planet and usher in a new dark age. Every nation on Earth is in the process of, or has already passed, its own set of carbon tax laws and regulations. If their plan is successful, every nation on Earth will not only pay tribute to the powerful world government, but every facet of human life will be regulated by the technocratic global planners. Under the carbon tax scheme, China, India, Mexico, and over 150 other nations are exempt from the global tax system. You see, the bankers already own and control the third world. Their final target is the middle class of the West. Once they've dismantled the economies of the United States, Europe, and Japan, they believe no one can stand in their way. In short, the New World Order is a global corporate takeover. In their global corporate state, there is no room for individuality, sovereignty, or independence. As their program begins to face more and more opposition, lawmakers and supporters of the man-made global warming hypothesis want laws to be passed, making it illegal to question their theories. Recently, the head of Greenpeace was forced to admit that the Arctic and Antarctic ice caps grow in the winter and shrink in the summer, and that this is all part of a natural process driven by the tilt of the Earth and the sun. The cosmic radiation coming from space, the amount reaching the Earth is affected by the strength of the Sun's magnetic field. So the magnetic field of the Sun is almost like a, a gateway controlling the cosmic radiation reaching the Earth. The magnetic strength of the Sun is also related to the number of sunspots. So they are, are directly related to changes within the inner structure of the Sun. The amount of cosmic radiation reaching the lower atmosphere creates more cloud, right? And, and cloud forms, you need to have what are called condensation nuclei. That is, little particles around which water can change from water vapor gas into water droplets, minute particles that are visible in the form of clouds. We've known for a long time that there was more cloud than the amount of particles in the atmosphere, because we assumed it was clay particles and salt particles that were creating this condensation process. Um, 
but there was this gap. We now realize, of course, it's the cosmic radiation that's doing it. So what the cosmic radiation is doing, controlled by the magnetic field of the sun, is putting up, a, it's like putting up a screen in the greenhouse and blocking out the sunlight. And, and of course, that then affects the temperature of the Earth. That's why there's a relationship between the sunspots and the temperature on the Earth. So we now know the mechanism, but they completely ignore that. More than 31,000 scientists from across the United States, including more than 9,000 PhDs, from the fields of climatology, atmospheric science, earth science, and hydrology, signed a petition rejecting man-made global warming as a scientific fraud. This shattered the hoax of the so-called consensus that the mainstream media had been pushing for years, that every scientist on Earth believed that man-made global warming was a fact. If the people are able to block their carbon tax takeover, the elite's agenda to establish a planetary world government will collapse. To force their unpopular agenda upon the planet, the controllers are racing to complete the construction of their police state control grid borrowing from tactics used in the past by communist, fascist, and other totalitarian regimes. Every form of classical textbook tyranny is now being implemented in the West. In the United States, the central government is federalizing local police. State and local officers are in a great position to collect important information on terrorists and their allies. And the Terrorist Screening Center stands ready to help you. This video, produced by Homeland Security, is required viewing for all departments in the U.S. And with the teamwork of local, state, and federal law enforcement, we have an excellent opportunity to see the picture and solve the puzzle before these terrorists can strike again. State, county, and city police now take their marching orders directly from DHS and FEMA. The videos and training manuals turn peace officers, once guardians of the Republic, into secret police. See way down there? There's a woman taking photos of the dam. Someone called 911 and reported a suspicious person. As you guessed, she's gonna be a category three hit. And since it's very important that we don't let her know that we know, both the dispatcher and the officer need to make sure radio she secure. doesn't hear the radio traffic. Stand by. If I could ask you to wait right here, please. Sure. Everyday items and activities are listed as proof that you are sympathizing with shadowy boogeymen of terror. Of course, he's going to keep his eyes open for anything interesting or unusual in the car. That would include cameras, binoculars, video equipment, GPS, maybe things like sleeping bags that suggest they're living out of the car. From their inception, Homeland Security and Northcom were set up to dominate the people and the states, not to fight the CIA-created Al-Qaeda. Patriotic members of the military and law enforcement, at great risk to their lives and careers, have sent this filmmaker federally and internationally produced law enforcement manuals, textbooks, documents, and videos. The Mayak Report, distributed to Missouri law enforcement, lists gun owners, libertarians, constitutionalists as potential terrorists. The federally written document went on to list Ron Paul, Bob Barr, and American flag bumper stickers as dangerous paraphernalia linked to white supremacists. Even before 9-11, FEMA was quietly indoctrinating local police to have a hatred of the Founding Fathers and everything our Constitutional Republic stands for. Who was the first terrorist organization in the United States? <clears throat> Who? Founding Fathers. Founding Fathers. Founding Fathers. You mean Thomas Jefferson? Oh, yeah. You mean uh, George Washington? Oh, yeah. Paul Revere? Yeah. Yeah. These guys right here, let me ask you something. Did they try to scare people? <laughs> oh, yeah. They tried to intimidate the British. Did they, try to, did they use acts of violence? Your founding fathers, my founding fathers, were involved in acts of terrorism against British officials because they systematically had British officials assassinated. Assassinated. In the old Soviet Union, Nazi Germany, and Maoist China, the police main job was not fighting crime. In totalitarian forms of government, the police are political enforcers, or commissars as they were known in Russia. 
It's their job to spy on the public and to intimidate the exercise of free speech. Once a climate of fear has been achieved, the public begins to self-censor, to shut down. Once the people have been intimidated to withdraw from the field of intellectual battle, the tyrants have a free hand to expand their oppression and looting of the helpless serfs. The average man and woman is in a trance. They get home from work, they don't even talk to their children, they turn the television on, and they let those corporate messages set the agenda in their lives. If we want a revolution against these social engineers and the scientific dictatorship, we have to start getting back to basics, having barbecues, knowing our neighbors, loving our husbands and wives, spending time with our children, and getting back to real human culture. This false corporate culture has been superimposed over our daily lives. The public is literally under a trance. We have to somehow reach out to them and break them out of this trance. And as the globalists destroy our standard of living and bring in their police state, a lot of people are beginning to wake up and realize that what they've been told all their lives was a lie. But it's essential that we the people are there to reach out to our fellow Americans and our fellow human beings and show them the truth. But the scientific dictatorship needs more than just a secret police network to carry out their plan. Citizen spies at every level of society have been recruited to keep their eyes and ears focused on everything their neighbors and co-workers are doing and saying. More than 50,000 private sector executives have been recruited by FEMA to secretly serve as deputy FBI informants under the InfraGuard program. Now there are more than 75,000 preachers serving FEMA in the clergy response teams. Internal FEMA documents reveal that the majority of America's pastors now serve as agents of the shadow government. They are even instructed on how and what to preach. And as KSLA News 12 Jeff Farrell discovered, the clergy would help the government with potentially their biggest problem, us. From my cold, dead hands. Charlton Heston's famous declaration captures a truly American value, the overarching desire to protect our freedoms. But gun confiscation is exactly what happened during the state of emergency following Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. U.S. troops also arrived, something far easier to do even now thanks to last year's elimination of the 1878 Posse Comitatus Act. That forbid U.S. troops from policing on American soil. If martial law were enacted here at home, public fears and quelling dissent would be critical. And that's exactly what the clergy response team, as it's called, helped accomplish in New Orleans. Uh, Jeff, the primary thing that we say to anybody is let's cooperate and get this thing over with, and then we'll settle the differences once the crisis is over. Such clergy response teams would walk a tightrope between the needs of the government versus the wishes of the public. In a lot of cases, these clergy would already be known in the neighborhoods in which they're helping to defuse that situation. For the clergy, one of the biggest tools that they will have in helping calm the public down or obey the law is the Bible itself, specifically Romans, Romans 13. Because the government is established by the Lord, you know, and, uh, and that's what we believe in the Christian faith. That's what's stated in the scripture. They prepare their flocks like sheep to the slaughter for gun confiscation forced inoculation, and they tell them that it is a blessing to have their families broken up and put into FEMA camps. Adolf Hitler bragged that his most powerful domestic tool used by the Nazis to control the people was the servile clergy, and his favorite Bible verse was Romans 13. Render unto Caesar. Either you are with us or you are with the terrorists. The scam was launched as a simple bait and switch. The government recruited the public by telling them that they were needed in the fight against Al Qaeda. But from day one, over 90% of their training and operations focus on demonizing, surveilling, and harassing anyone who stands against their takeover. 
The Department of Homeland Security calling on firefighters to take on a new role in the war on terror. The idea to be the eyes for the U.S. government when they're inside a home. Now, unlike police officers, firefighters don't need a warrant to go into private houses. And critics say that's where things get sticky. Cable company repairmen, truck drivers, maid services, and hundreds of other professions that go inside homes and businesses without warrants are now on the government's payroll as citizen snitch spies. But Big Brother doesn't stop there. Children are being indoctrinated inside the public schools nationwide to spy on their parents. You can give information without having to give your name. You guys can get paid for good tips up to $200. The New York Times praised public school programs in the United States and England that are training children to report their parents for eco-crimes, like taking a hot bath or letting the water run while you brush your teeth. All of that violates their carbon footprint credit allotment. Check it out, check it out. And that's where we come in. We're the carbon cops and we're on the lookout for energy wasters. Our job is to get all Australian households to cut their carbon emissions. So Carbon Cops is a program that looked at energy use in a domestic sense. We went into people's houses and got them to reduce their energy use by 50%. Sadly, the Boy Scouts of America have now contracted with the Department of Homeland Security and are now training more than 20,000 Boy Scouts in anti-terror urban warfare mount training. The federal grants are very specific. The scouts are trained to carry out seek and destroy missions against disgruntled veterans of the U.S. Armed Forces. Good evening, everyone. Homeland Security is enlisting some unlikely new recruits to fight terrorism and help with other emergencies. The Girl Scouts. Girl Scouts across the country and here in East Tennessee are now taking part. Nine-year-old Elise Murphy has already earned a lot of Girl Scout patches. And now. Every member of the 3.4 million Girl Scouts of America 